In this lesson, we're going to go over how to properly use drip line. We're going to take a look at the manufacturer's specifications for a particular drip line product so we know how much to use, how long a lateral line can go, and also what is the flow per hundred feet. The problem with the drip sometimes is that people assume because it's you know considered low flow irrigation that you can just put as much as you want to on a zone and you'll never run out of water. Well, I can tell you that that's not true. You just have to more carefully calculate what you're doing with the drip line or other drip products just so that you can properly supply that amount of water and not do it at a velocity that's going to build up extra um, friction loss and pressure loss throughout the zone, we want all this stuff balanced out. So let's take a look at the first chart here. And this is a chart for Netafem's regular tech line product. They have a CV, a check valve product that has a different set of specifications, but we're just looking here at the basic product. Now look over to the right side and we're basically looking at ground cover or plantings, ornamental bushes, so forth. Basically what we would consider our planting beds and so forth. But we're looking at three different kinds of soil quality here. And if you look at the range is sand, loam, and clay. Now clay is the smallest particle water has a harder time absorbing down into the ground, and it also is slower to release out to evaporation into the plants. So clay is on one end of the spectrum, the very smallest particle size, and then on the other end of the spectrum is sand, which has the largest particle size, and no problem whatsoever for water to infiltrate or percolate down into the ground. So if you look at the numbers here, we have a, a higher flow rate for sand than we do for clay. We want to apply water a lot slower to clay than we do to sand and of course the silt or loam in the middle is just basically a midway point between the two. And so if, as you look at these values that are highlighted, we're looking at the flow of the drippers and also the spacing of the drippers on the line. Now, you know, we can get 12, 18, or 24 inch spacing. And if you look at this chart here, you'll see what it recommends for each type of soil quality. Now let's take a look at the second chart here and look midway down and what we have highlighted here is the lateral spacing. And basically what this is referring to is that if you had one line of drip line going out and then the next one that you were going to have, let's say that you were building a, a, a grid or basically just a, a set of parallel lines, you're going to want to know how far apart to space them. Now you can buy the product with the frequency or the interval spacing the way you want it, 12 inch, 18 or 24, but we also need to know how far to space these lateral lines apart and that's basically what this chart is giving us. So let's go on to the next chart. What you're going to see here on this chart is the application rate. That's the next to the last line. And you notice that for each of the different soil qualities, it's given you a different application rate based on the size of the drippers that we choose for that particular soil type. But as you see for the sand, it's laying water down at a much higher application rate than what we've picked out for the clay. And on the last line, you'll see the time to achieve a quarter inch of water. Now, a lot of people pay attention to the amount of water, and this correlates to inches of water. Let's say if we get a rain, that's measured in how much inches that we get. Say we get a half inch of rain in a day. Well, that's basically the same way that we're measuring this water. And we're looking at the amount of time that it achieves a quarter inch of watering. And generally, that's always been kind of a loose rule of thumb in the irrigation business is that each time that you water, we're trying to get down about a quarter inch of water. Now that's going to vary, and I'm not so crazy about using just general guidelines because it definitely varies between clay, loam, and sand as to how long that water is going to stay in the soil, uh, how long it's going to take to dissipate out, and all that. So really, you know, this 
a desire to get one quarter inch is just a general guideline. And later on, once we get into the courses about scheduling, you'll be able to see how to properly schedule a system for your soil type. But in this kind of business, it, nothing's really set in stone because there's a lot of different factors that can come into play. Thankfully, drip irrigation mitigates some of the things that we have to deal with as far as wind and evaporation and slope and so forth. But slope still has to be taken into consideration, just the same as soil quality, the plant types and so forth. So there's a lot of things going on here, and for whatever product that you choose, definitely go to that manufacturer and get a set of these type of specification charts so that you'll know. We definitely want to put out the maximum amount so that we are getting full monetary value out of the zones that we're constructing. We want to be efficient in that way, but we don't want to exceed the amount of drip line that we put on a zone because that will affect how everything gets watered. If you exceed its ability to flow the water out to all the drippers, then you're going to get some plants that are not getting uh, irrigated in the same way as others. And when it comes to agriculture, what we're looking for is even canopy height, even growth rates across all the plants. And that's what drip line is best at doing. We just have to watch out for a few things. <clears throat> One of the things that is recommended by all the manufacturers is that when you lay these things out, that you put it into a loop. Okay, if you were just started off and you had one source and a lateral line that goes out and terminates on its own uh, without connecting into a loop, then let's say you get a nick or a break halfway down the line, you're going to get probably full flow to the drippers right up to that break and then maybe nothing or very low flow beyond it. But if we wrap everything around into a loop, then if you get a break or a nick partway down the line, then you've got water going through the drippers or going through the loop from both directions, and hopefully it'll supply enough water to work those drippers until you can get it fixed. If it's a catastrophic break, you know, and it just breaks open, a lot of times the, the water will flow right out and none will come out in the drippers. But the putting, putting the drip line into a loop it helps balance the, the flow and the pressure throughout that. And we're going to take a look at some drawings on the whiteboard here in just a minute. I'm going to show you kind of a good, better, best situation on how to lay out the drip zones. Now let's take a look at the specifications for the drip line that we were demonstrating in the last lesson there. Landscape products, quarter inch drip line. And it has spacing of 12 inches. And at each foot of drip line, we're going to get a half a gallon per hour flow. And so that means that the length of a single lateral line is going to be around 33 feet. What Landscape Products recommends as the maximum operating pressure is 30 PSI, but the recommended operating pressure is 20 PSI. Now, when you pick up this product, it's going to have these figures on the label, so it's easy to get to, but obviously all these things are accessible via the internet. And as we look further on down this chart, you'll see the pressure and the discharge rate for the range that you're going to get between 10 and 30 PSI. And you'll see how that discharge rate changes. And we know if you've gone through the free class that we offer with some information on water hydraulics, you'd know that as pressure increases, flow increases as well. So these things aren't perfect in the fact that a lot of them are pressure compensating and so forth. Uh, but the higher the pressure that you have in the line, the more water that it's going to squeeze out. So with these type of drip line products, it's always best to tailor the pressure reducing valve, the pressure reducer that you have somewhere on that zone, tailor that to the maximum or the, re excuse me, the recommended operating pressure for each product that you're going to use. And that way you're going to get the intended results and it gives you a way to go back and be able to troubleshoot. If you just went out there and did whatever you wanted to do at any pressure, at any length, 
when it doesn't work, you don't have really anything to fall back on. But when you follow the manufacturer specifications and you lay everything out and it doesn't work, then that gives you a step that, that you can walk back through and find out what's going on. And it's always best to follow the manufacturer's guidelines just for that purpose. Okay, we're going to look at a few illustrations here, and these are going to show us the different ways that we can lay out our drip line. In our first illustration, we're going to label this one as adequate. It's not the most recommended way of doing things. It's uh, Sometimes it's the way that you have to do things, and I know that I've personally had to lay out a system like this because of budget constraints and also because of the layout of the property. But what you're looking at here is a PVC pipe going down the left side of the illustration. And from there, three different lines of drip line uh, radiate from the left out to the right and then self-terminate. The ends are just folded over and crimped. They don't go into a loop, nor do they connect to another header. These are called lateral lines. And we're going to take a look at some practical exercises here. We're going to calculate how much of this pipe that we can use for each lateral line. So we're going to look at our chart, and we've chosen the 18-inch spacing with the 0.6 gallon per hour flow rate. And we see from the chart that we can get 514 feet on a lateral line. Now, we're also going to take a look at our chart that shows the flow per 100 feet. And what we're looking at here with our product, we see that the flow per 100 feet is 0.68 gallons per minute. You could use the gallons per hour figure, but you'll just have to multiply your end result by 60 to get your gallon per minute. But if you've got the uh, numbers available for gallons per minute, go ahead and calculate with that because all of your friction loss charts for your PVC pipe, and that's why we're doing this here, to see how many of these lateral lines we can get on that one header. So let's take the 0.68 gallons per minute, and we're going to multiply it by 5.14 because we're going to be able to use a lateral line that's 514 feet, and our flow is per 100 feet, 0.68 times 5.14. That gives us uh, 3.5 gallons per minute per lateral line. What we're using here uh, as a, 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 our header is our class 200 one inch pipe. So let's take a look at the friction loss chart for that particular uh, piece of pipe there. Um, we find that 16 gallons per minute is our upper limit. Now, I hope that you've gone through our previous courses, our, inter our free course, the Introduction to Irrigation, which tells you about water hydraulics, and then our course on piping systems goes into much greater detail about how to read a friction loss chart. And this is very fundamental skills that you're going to need to have in the irrigation business. So if you're not quite sure what we're looking at here on this friction loss chart, I definitely recommend that you go back and go through those courses. Now, for now, we're going to look at this chart, and we're going to look in the one-inch column, and we're going to go down the right side until we get to the last line before it gets into the gray shaded area. That gray shaded area represents velocities and friction losses that are undesirable. So we want to get to the last line just before that and now carry it back to the left. And we see that 16 gallons per minute is our upper limit of flow for this class 200 one inch pipe. So if we take our 16 gallons per minute, divide it by the 3.5 for each of the lateral lines, that gives us 4.57. So we could use four of these fully length lateral lines and a half. So probably I would just use four. It looks like for an example like this, we're trying to keep a grid or a more or less square or rectangular pattern. Um, so, you know, a half a line, maybe if you need that somewhere, you know that you have the capacity for it. But probably what I would do in this uh, situation is put out four lateral lines that are all the same length. And that brings us to the question of why have we a uh, labeled this particular example only adequate? Well, it's not recommended because, you know, you have the friction loss that occurs as you go out the pipe. So once the water leaves the header, it's losing a little bit more power in the friction loss, the turbulence that's happening inside of the tube so that the drippers that are the closest to the header have more strength than the drippers at the end. 
And what that's going to give you is uneven growth rates all the way down the line. So there is a fix for this. You can make sure that you get a product that has pressure compensating drippers. And that's what we do in a situation like this. And like I mentioned before, I've had to do this particular configuration because of budget constraints on a very large project. So you don't want less power in the drippers or less water coming out of the very last drippers on the line. So you select a pressure compensating product to take care of that. So now let's take a look at the second illustration, and this is going to be a better situation. And this is recommended by the manufacturers that you always put the drip line into a loop. And because you have water that's going two separate ways on this, you can actually use twice as much drip line on a single tap. If we use our same set of calculations from the previous example, in this loop we could use 1,028 feet of drip line. Now, one of the things I would suggest about doing the, the tap or the outlet for this, it's really designed so that one outlet could go out and go into a loop. But if I'm setting this up, I'm going to tee off with PVC and then do a PVC tee with two separate outlets just to make sure that you have full flow going into each end. So if you did just the tee with drip line, that will work, but I would caution against that. And I always try to make decisions that ensure that I'm going to get full flow into that pipe just in case maybe the pressure goes down for whatever reason at some point um, or flow goes down. We just want to make sure that you get full flow. And one of the ways that uh, going into a loop is beneficial is that, you know, this drip line is always under danger of getting hit by, you know, weed whackers or maybe even little chipmunks and critters tend to chew on a little bit. So if there's a little hole somewhere and you've only got water coming from one direction, then you know you're definitely going to compromise the drippers that are downstream from that bit of damage. So the theory is, is that if it's in a loop, you've got water and pressure coming from two different angles so that even if you are losing some water there, you know, in a bite or a crack or a gash in the pipe, that you're still getting water coming out of the other drippers. Now let's look at the example that we would consider best. And this is where you have more than one header. Now, if you read the literature that, you know, the manufacturers really consider one to be a supply and the other to be an exhaust header. But since you have pressure coming up both headers, it's really just two different supply sources. So if we were looking at this in the same situation as our first example where we're laid out here, we, in our first example, we only got 514 feet per line, but now with another header and water coming the opposite direction, we can double the amount that we put on there. So each of those lateral lines could be 1,028 feet. And this is considered optimum. And whole grids can be laid out this way. Many, many acres are laid out with headers back to back. Just make sure that for each header, you have enough water to supply the entire bit that is coming off of each header. So it's really uh, simple here, but sometimes you just have to use the example that works best for your situation.